Hey, welcome. Thank you uh, for joining the webinar, uh, Distributed Energy in the Property Sector, today's opportunity. My name is Chris Wade. I'm Head of Property at the Clean Energy Finance Corporation, and I will be moderating this webinar. Before we start, I would like to acknowledge, acknowledge the traditional owners of the land in which we stand and pay our respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. The purpose of this webinar is to run through the key findings of the Distributed Energy Report that we co-sponsored with the Property Council of Australia and was prepared by Energetics. In addition to providing some real-life case studies of distributed energy initiatives that are being implemented by Woolworths and Monash University. In terms of the format and speakers for the webinar, uh, firstly I'll provide an initial introduction and context for the report. Matt Sprague, uh, Senior Manager of Energetics, will run through the key report findings. Michael Shelley, Group Energy Manager at Woolworths, will discuss their distributed energy journey. And Dr. Kendra Wazalak, Sustainable Development Planner at Monash University, will discuss a range of distributed energy initiatives that are being implemented by Monash as part of their broader net zero emission strategy. I'll finish with a quick overview of CSD's property financing strategy as well as various financing options that could assist in financing distributed energy initiatives. We're targeting to complete uh, the presentations um, by 11.15am Eastern Standard Time, leaving 15 minutes for Q&A. However, I'd encourage everyone to send their questions um, throughout the webinar uh, and we'll look to address them uh, during the Q&A session. At the end of the webinar, uh, you'll be directed to a quick survey and we'll be looking to email a copy of the webinar slides to all participants later this week. Just a bit of sort of uh, context and introduction, you know, the CSC and, and PCA sponsored the preparation of this report and it was formally released in mid-September at the PCA's annual Property Congress in Darwin. This report is available uh, by download from the CSC website. The purpose of this report was to provide asset owners, builders and tenants with an up-to-date, with up-to-date and practical information in relation to currently available distributed energy technologies and how they can be deployed to save energy costs and reduce greenhouse gas emissions. A key emphasis of the report was to provide an easy to use and practical guide to current distributed energy technology, with a particular emphasis on economics and paybacks, implementation considerations, and importantly, real life case studies where other parties have already deployed this technology in, in practical scenarios. The report also complements the CSC's 50 best practice initiatives report that we issued in 2017 that provided similar practical information uh, with probably a greater focus on energy efficient technology. Now, if I hand over to Matt Sprague, just a bit of an intro before Matt goes through the report findings. Uh, you know, Matt is Senior Manager at Energetics uh, with qualifications in chemical engineering and renewable energy. Matt is an experienced advocate for energy efficiency, productivity improvements and projects that deliver cost effective, reliable and clean energy supply. So, over to you, Matt. Thanks, Chris. Uh, hi everyone, I'm Matt Spray from Energetics. I did the modelling behind the report and was the lead author from uh, Energetics' side. For, for, this, uh, for this report and guide, we were asked to consider the most common forms of distributed energy and develop high-level business cases for each one of those. We presented the indicative payback periods by state for each technology across five different subsectors in the property sector. From the outset, I'd like to say that naturally in coming up with a single payback period, there are many variables. So the figures presented in the guide and in this PowerPoint um, are intended as a guide. So why was Energetics uh, selected to do this work? 
We're a, an energy and climate change management consulting firm, and we've worked across all sectors of the economy for the past 35 years, advising business and government on projects from energy efficiency, renewable energy, uh, to strategy and policy setting. We've experience in energy data, electricity and financial modeling, strategy and energy efficiency. This guide was also a collaborative approach with the CEFC and the PCA. I'd like to thank Paul Dowling from the CEFC and Frankie Muscovich from the PCA for their support. So starting off with the first technology was solar PV, so solar photovoltaic, roof-mounted solar on buildings across various different asset types. And we sized the systems to meet 10 to 20 percent of the site's electrical load and understanding that some buildings have larger or smaller roofs. The key findings really are that the roof-mounted PV is the most common, with ground-mounted systems an option but only really seen on the larger scale. The positive results from the solar PV is that it's applicable across the country, uh, that all states have less than a five-year payback, and it depends on the, the system sizing to really understand the, de the detailed payback of those system sizes. Typically, smaller systems offer a better payback due to some of the federal government rebate systems that are in place at the moment for less than 100 kilowatt systems. Solar PV offers good financial returns. It also reduces reliance on grid electricity and enables clients to um, increase their resilience uh, across their portfolio and reduce their reliance. It also has a good opportunity of being able to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. So the next step for solar PV for um, building owners was really to understand your electricity interval data, size the system appropriately, and your, the shape of your site load as well is very important. Determine the roof size and therefore the available PV array sizing, and understand any financial assistance via the renewable energy target with the small certificates and large scale generation certificates that may be applicable. The next technology we looked at was batteries, standalone batteries, and these give the user the ability to charge during off-peak periods and discharge during peak electricity periods and uh, accessing the arbitrage between the two to generate the savings. We modeled these as typical lithium-ion batteries, um, but there are various different technologies available which have different pros and cons depending on your site requirements. And we modeled it on today's prices, but we are expecting costs to fall relatively significantly over the next five to ten years. So whilst the payback is in the in the five to ten year plus range, um, we are expecting those numbers to come down. So batteries give you the, the opportunity to access that arbitrage, as I mentioned. They also give you the opportunity to reduce your peak demand charges by shifting the load for the building. And that, these can be 5 to 50% 50, 50 of the bill, depending on which state or territory you're in. They're, one of the other um, advantages of batteries is by installing a battery, you may be able to reduce um, electricity grid upgrade costs which was the example that we presented in the report for Domino's Pizza. They decided to install batteries rather than uh, in upgrading the, the grid in their region. So they realized that battery installed was approximately 50% of the grid augmentation, uh, and it also allowed them to access that payback as well. So it gives you good um, independence from the grid as well. So solar PV and batteries is a, a hybrid of the two technologies, um, and typically the solar pulls down the paybacks for the batteries, but still in that five to ten year payback period. They're, they are complementary, and a lot of people are looking at 
implementing both at the same time really gives you the opportunity to increase the solar system size, furthering reducing your emissions and your um, electricity grid reliance. So thermal storage is the storage of either chilled water, hot water, or um, ice storage. So we, we modeled this as a, a chilled water storage using electric chillers and insulated tanks. And typically these are um, used at large commercial, retail, and industrial sites, which use large volumes of chilled water and have enough space to be able to install the tanks. The, the payback for this system is um, above 10 years, and the, the reason for that is that the arbitrage cost between peak and off-peak generation of chilled water doesn't cover the capital cost of the large tanks installed. There is opportunity to reduce the chill of capacity, um, but that's only applicable to new installs or end-of-life installs as well. It does give you the opportunity to reduce your peak demand charges and and capital costs for new installs and, and gives you a little bit more um, capacity in the system as well. The good example of this was at uh, James Cook University in Townsville. They've in, they installed a, a large central chiller plant with a lot of chilled water storage as well. Solar hot water is a renewable form of generating hot water for either domestic or potable systems. So this can be used in uh, heating, showers, or uh, other hot water uses. And typically the water is stored in tanks and then boosted using electric or gas boosters to meet required temperatures for either, for either the temperature of use or to remove Legionella from the system. The paybacks for this are above 10 years, um, typically across the sector. And there's no significant economy of scale by installing larger systems. So why would you install this? It can be, the, the hot water can be stored more easily than using solar PV. Um, so if there's no constant demand of electricity, this is an option to be able to generate hot water for use. And typically hot water is used early in the morning and early in the evening. And it reduces gas or electricity consumption, therefore reducing reliance on network supply. So maybe more applicable to regional areas with uh, poorer energy supply connections. So the next steps for solar hot water would be similar to PV is in understanding your load profile, your roof size, and calculating the available hot water for, for the building. Air sourced heat pumps are um, a technology which takes heat or cool energy from uh, ambient air and is generally is generally three times more efficient than traditional heating electric heating technologies or gas heating technologies. Whilst the payback here is saying that it's above ten years, this doesn't consider new builds or end of life replacements. What we've considered here is uh, retrofitting upgrades. So if you're installing new buildings or your existing technology is reaching its end of life, that payback may be down in the, in the five to six year payback region. So air source heat pumps are suitable for buildings with smaller roofs where hot, solar hot water may not be applicable or buildings with excessive shading and it reduces your electricity consumption, potentially reducing your demand charges, and it does have a, a better payback for houses with a higher electricity charge. The next step for air source heat pumps is to understand the ambient conditions. Typically, if you're looking for hot water heat pumps, they're more effective in hot regions, and if you're looking for chills, they're more effective in cold regions, so understanding ambient conditions is important in sizing the correct system. 
ground source heat pumps are similar to air source heat pumps in the way that they work, but instead of transitioning heat to the air, they use the constant ground temperature. And typically, these can either be drilled vertically down into the ground or can be laid horizontally in trenches. That both have different advantages and disadvantages. Um, there is growing interest in this technology in the residential um, and SME market in Australia, and Fraser's have just installed around about 500 of these across their new development in um, in Western Sydney. And they're typically twice as efficient as an air source heat pump, so it can have pretty significant energy and cost savings. And they, they have the same... Oh, sorry, sir. Sorry, Matt, I just wanted to add, on just know the questions in this Q&A, just in terms of the colour coding, the blue 5 to 10, that sort of matches the orange. Yes. Uh, just, I know there's a, a couple of questions on it, but that, you know, where you see orange, that's 5 to 10 years, play that. Yeah, thanks, Chris. That's correct. That must have just flipped over. So, uh, ground source heat pumps are suited to buildings with small roof areas or excessive shading like air source heat pumps, and they have the same advantages as the air source heat pump, but also they provide uh, design advantages because the systems don't need um, air islands, heat islands around the outdoor unit. There's no, there's no airflow required, and typically they're slightly smaller than traditional air conditioning systems, so they can fit into smaller areas or have uh, areas where there's height limitations. So it gives architects and mechanical designers more, more flexibility around the install. So a renewable PPA is different to the other technologies that we've presented. This isn't an on-site opportunity. This is typically done with a large off-site either wind or solar farm. Energetics have a, a lot of experts in this field, and I can't claim to be one of them, um, but I'll do my best to present the, the opportunity here. So this is a, a contracting model, an arrangement. It's not a choice of technology. However, you are able to select the project that you purchase from, so you are able to select between wind and solar. It can be a very tailored approach for large corporates, providing a lot of flexibility, um, and is typically available to large energy users across their portfolio. It can be it can be used as a risk management and hedging option rather than just an emissions and cost reduction opportunity. And there is growing interest in the product across the market at the moment. So on our website, on the Energetics website, you'll find guidance that we've written around PPAs um, in conjunction with the Melbourne Renewable Energy Project that's commencing at the moment. And that's a, a reference guide I'd refer you to. And also this month, the New South Wales government is releasing its own guide that we've authored into renewable PPAs. A PPA gives you the opportunity to purchase electricity as well as the LGCs and therefore reduce your emissions through electricity procurement. The next step for renewable PPAs is to address the context around other electricity procurement strategies to manage the price risk exposure in a volatile market. We would suggest that an options paper be drafted as a first step to understand the role of the PPA as part of your procurement mix. So if there, are, if there are any questions, please feel free to put them through the Q&A or alternatively um, contact Energetics and we'd be happy to answer some more detail. Thanks, Matt. Um, now just turning to um, a case study with, with more work. Um, so Michael, uh, just a bit of a Background to Michael Shelley, um, he's got tw over 20 years experience in, in most facets of the, the energy industry. Uh, broad experience gained through model roles in sales, customer service, business improvement and technical disciplines for two of Australia's largest energy, energy retailers. 
So, Mark, we're handing over to you to, to uh, talk about your journey uh, for your work in distributed energy. Uh, thank you. Um, okay, so uh, I'll just quickly uh, touch on the slide, the uh, first slide here, which represents uh, the pages that were out of the report, um, which just give a quick highlight of the, the solar uh, poll page, um, and jump straight into, I guess, energy at, uh, and sustainability at Woolworths. Um, so just a bit of background, uh, Woolworths is, is certainly um, heading towards uh, some targets that we set back in 2015. Uh, to run through to 2020, and key amongst those in what we call a planet uh, pillar are uh, around things that, that specifically around the environment. Um, and in my space, in, in the energy space uh, within Woolworths, um, I sort of look after the responding to climate change, which is uh, items number 13 and 14 that you can see on the page, which is essentially trying to reduce our carbon emissions uh, by 10% below 2015 levels. Uh, we're currently sitting at 13% below 2015 levels, um, so we're tracking uh, actually above or, or below the yeah, above target on that uh, on that uh, metric. Uh, and the second one there is around uh, reducing our uh, uh, CO2 emissions from refrigerant gases, as refrigeration is a uh, major uh, source of um, energy use within our portfolio. Um, so we see there, uh, from a value chain point of view, we're just trying to do what we can in terms of um, providing a more sustainable environment and uh, working towards the circular economy around and responding to climate change. Um, energy within Woolworths. Um, so we consume roughly about 1% of energy's energy requirements. Uh, sorry, it's Australia's energy requirements. Um, of that, uh, as you can see, in that bottom graph uh, with the red and grey bars, uh, supermarkets make up the uh, vast majority, about 80% of the energy consumed within the group. Um, within, within the business, uh, refrigeration, um, HVAC and lighting make up the majority of use. Uh, certainly refrigeration would be the largest proportion within that, uh, that mix. Uh, and so what we've done within the work is to set up an energy management centre uh, to manage our consumption across our supermarket stores as, as a primary focus at the moment. Uh, this provides real-time visibility of energy usage through our stores and allows our technicians and our uh, energy optimization specialists to essentially remotely control um, refrigeration and HVAC equipment, um, um, both through the, the building management system, through our phone manual, uh, and through some other uh, controls that we have uh, on site. Um, you can see there the journey we work with uh, in the biogas uh, work has been on a, I guess a journey to trying to reduce our overall um, carbon uh, emissions and our energy intensity. So uh, we're certainly uh, heading in the right direction and, and it's fair to say that uh, that will continue to, to reduce as we move through this uh, next phase. So from a solar perspective, um, we've been on the solar journey now since back in 2009 when we installed our first uh, solar um, systems on a couple of uh, petrol stations in the ACT. Um, it wasn't until probably 2014 when uh, the economics really started to um, pay back in terms of uh, yeah, getting in under sort of five years and certainly in line with what uh, the energetics have put forward. Um, we've sort of seen payback in that sort of three and a half to four years in terms of assistance. Um, the typical installation um, uh, would provide about 13% of the stored energy requirements. Uh, the photo that you see there with that stored mega bar, that's about a 316 kilowatt system, which would be sort of pushing mid 20% in terms of um, moving the stores requirements. But yeah, we certainly run out of roof space well before we can self supply a store. Um, across our fleet, we have 62 stores that have uh, 62 locations that have um, solar panels on them, including a, a couple of large distribution centres as well. And we'll, FY19 will continue to roll that out. Um, and probably the most exciting piece around that at the moment, we're also working with Transgrid, uh, trialling a, a Tesla battery out of one of our um, distribution centres, um, and in line with uh, the earlier slides around, you know, doing some tariff arbitrage, demand management. Um, yeah, we're potentially looking at, at working in the, uh, the short-term response market in terms of the FCAP and good support. Um, 
I guess the learnings for us, the key learnings were obviously around um, internal uh, stakeholders and ensuring that we had um, alignment from those senior executives to understand that uh, this is a longer term play, uh, whilst the ROI is impressive. There are, you know, we're always competing for capital internally and we need to ensure that, uh, that we are you know, financially stacking up, but also from a sustainability point of view, this is also a good story for us. And it certainly helps reduce our COC to emissions and uh, aligning with our sustainability goals. Um, from an opportunity perspective, uh, the biggest hurdle for us is around getting access to the space. Uh, we work uh, typically uh, with much of the property portfolio, uh, and therefore we need to get you know, uh, approvals from landlords uh, to ensure that we have access to the, to the roof. Um, and not quite often that may also be a challenge in the sense that the landlords themselves are looking to do um, uh, large scale uh, solar rollouts on their centres that we're part of, or we may not have direct access to that roof because we're there, you know, three or four levels into a, uh, uh, a Westfield shopping centre, as an example. Um, so at the moment, we're certainly working with a lot of those um, retail investment funds um, and third party providers uh, on uh, behind the need of PPAs. Uh, to see where we can help underpin that process and still allow ourselves to get access to competitive, uh, competitive good price energy. Um, and uh, as mentioned before, we certainly trialling some batteries um, around some sort of demand by the, uh, management initiatives to make sure that we optimise uh, both our, our own capital investment as well as um, the yeah, PPA that we enter into. Um, as the market shifts to more renewable energy, um, you know, you already start to see the hollowing out of midday pricing in the wholesale market, um, and you have the subsequent uh, peaks in the morning and the evening. So, trying to make sure that uh, we're not installing something that uh, in five or ten years' time is uh, essentially trying to completely rent free energy from the grid. Okay, that's it from uh, all If there's any questions, then put them in the box and I'll see if I can answer those for you. Okay. Um, thanks, Michael. Um, and again, we we'll appreciate all the Q and A's where we're getting into the system so I think people go through it to provide you with your questions of rise. Uh, please do the put them through the system. So now just um, turning to uh, a Monash University and Dr. Ken Rick uh, local rep. Um, uh, Dr. Kendra was like is the uh, Sustainable Development Planner at Monash University, where she manages the implementation of the Net Zero Emissions Initiative and Biodiversity Strategy. Now, recent achievements include the establishment of a power purchase agreement, the rollout of LED upgrades and rooftop solar across Monash's campuses, and the establishment of a building optimization program. So, over to you, Kendra. Great, thank you. Um, as Chris said, my name is Kendra Lovelock and I, although I'm a doctor, I work in the operations side of the business um, at the university. So today, I'm going to tell you, um, I've got a lot of slides, so I'm going to go quickly, but I'm going to give you a quick background to our um, net zero emissions initiative, um, and then focus on one of the case studies that's in the guide around our thermal precinct strategy, uh, and then talk about the pilot strategy that we did. Um, so if you're not familiar, Monash University is Australia's largest university. We have an uh, annual revenue of $2.4 billion. Uh, we have about 80,000 students, um, full-time, part-time, um, domestic and international, and about $50 million of international research income. Uh, to give you an idea of the size of the portfolio, we have four campuses and about 150 buildings. Uh, so in October last year, our Vice Chancellor made a very public commitment that we would commit to achieve net zero emissions by 2030. Um, and we did it with um, help from Climate Works um, and committed to a deep decarbonization pathway to target net zero emissions. Um, and a key element of that strategy is the 100% renewable power, which also means that we committed to transition off natural gas by 2030. Uh, the university committed 135 million between now and 2030 to achieve net um, zero emissions as well. Um, so our net zero emissions plan has multiple pillars. Um, the first one being um, energy efficiency and optimization of buildings, so you use less energy. Um, campus electrification, so that is in our commitment to come up natural gas, which is particularly around our heating. 
and maximizing on-site renewables. So in the past 12 months, we've added about 1.5 megawatts of rooftop solar. Uh, and by the end of next year, in total, across our campuses, we'll be up at 4 megawatts of rooftop solar. Even with all that solar, we still have to go off-site to purchase um, renewable energy. Um, because it's putting out 5 megawatts of solar that equals about 7% of our electricity use. Uh, so we've just signed an offtake agreement with the Murawara Wind Farm in Victoria. Um, we are designing our new buildings to be net zero ready, so that's all electric and making sure they have high performance building envelopes. Um, and we're aiming to achieve the passenger standard on our peninsula campus near residential building, which is currently under construction. Uh, we're also doing a lot around the development of a microgrid to have an intelligent energy network. Um, and in the end, we still have a few um, residual emissions to offset, um, which like air travel um, and fleet. Uh, so today, I'm particularly going to talk about the campus electrification. Um, and just pointing out that in transitioning to the new 100% renewable power, about half of our um, energy is used for heating and hot water, which is um, done with natural gas, and natural gas represents about a third of our emissions. Um, so if we want to be net zero emissions without just buying offsets for the gas, we need to transition off natural gas. Uh, so in 2015, we introduced the strategy um, to construct precinct based cooling solutions across the university, and it's a thermal precinct strategy. Um, but it was also developed into consideration of a number of our infrastructure strategies, so particularly our campus master plan, our strategic asset management plan for asset renewal, um, and then it came a little later in the piece, sort of maybe post-2015, um, with our net zero emissions strategy. Um, and that all um, basically informed our thermal precinct strategy. So the image on the screen is just a shot of our uh, placing campus, and it just shows sort of the, the distributed nature of um, boilers and chillers and package units for our heating and cooling. So there's quite a lot of assets. Uh, to give you a quick snapshot of what a thermal precinct strategy is, so essentially, as I showed in the last slide, we've got um, Oilers and chillers on each individual building, quite traditional. Uh, because of our campus, we have lots of buildings and they form little precincts. We have chemistry precincts, medical precincts, science precincts. Uh, and what the thermal precinct strategy is aiming to do is have one building as the hub in a precinct of geographically um, close buildings. It has the basically the heating and cooling infrastructure that feeds the rest of the precincts. Um, when we added our net zero strategy into the place, basically we took the boiler out of the equation to get rid of natural gas and went to heat pump technology to be all electric. Um, so we did do a business case that, um, a few years ago in, on the thermal precinct strategy, um, and it was basically having centralized heating and cooling hubs to serve multiple buildings. Um, and it shows that it would be more efficient, more flexible, and easier to maintain. Um, and it sets out our road, our road back for our mechanical asset renewal and also deliver our net zero emissions goals. And some of the key benefits is eliminating the risk of Legionella. We have some cooling towers, and minimizing operational costs and total life cycle costs. So the station size net, but the looking at the total business case over a 20 year period, which is a typical um, mechanical life cycle. Um, it was a $9 million net present value cost savings, just looking at the Clayton campus in this case. Um, it enables flexibility and for future expansion, so we're doing a lot of um, redevelopment on the campus. Um, so if we basically pick the building that's staying in the hub and put the infrastructure in there, as we make changes and um, renovate, demolish, and build new buildings in that precinct, then the, um, the hub can grow. Um, there's a redundancy built in in the case of mechanical failure, um, eliminating our exposure to volatile gas markets. So, when a few years ago, when we were doing the business case and talking about cutting the natural gas when it was really cheap, it wasn't as palatable as in May 12 months ago. In May 2017, our contract ended and we had a tripling of our gas price, so it made the business case to come off natural gas um, look a whole lot better. Uh, and then we've, it's given us some more control, design controls in our um, Monash design and construction standards to ensure that we're getting the outcomes we want from our assets. 
Um, so we're actually in the process of updating our business case. It's the original business case. Um, essentially, we've done when our gas and electricity prices were a lot lower. Um, and the original business case actually had um, thermal storage in it, so we're actually going with battery storage. Um, but you can see that uh, for the capital cost, it has a much much higher upfront capital cost. Um, composed, as opposed to distance as usual, and it has other things in it besides just the um, mechanical plant, so there's solar, LED lighting, and building shooting happening as part of the strategy. Um, from an operating cost and maintenance cost is essentially where the heat savings are compared to business as usual. So we eliminate our gas cost, uh, and we significantly reduce electricity costs, particularly through um, it's more efficient, so using a better third of the energy and then the savings on peak demand charges. Um, so the one in red, that's what I'm talking about, the, when we look at the net present value of the 20 year period, it was about a $9 million savings. Uh, again, a quick snapshot of Energetics model. So we'll, we'll, uh, we're in construction of a few precincts now, so we need to see what the actual comes out at. Um, but it's significant savings in our electricity costs, where we eliminate gas and significantly reduce electricity. Um, so the first precinct that we did as a pilot is our building 13 precinct, which is the medical precinct. Um, you can see in the image the, uh, the newer looking building with the grand green at the front. That is called the Biomedical Learning and Teaching Building, which is currently under construction. Um, and it is our first new building where we decided to go all electric, so there's no natural gas. The one that was built before that was opened earlier this year was the last one that had natural gas uh, in it. Uh, and then it's the hub for the medical precinct. Um, and it will be completed uh, due to open for the start of term one next year. Uh, and this is a little circle to show you which, where the precinct is in the Monash campus. Down at the bottom of the image is um, Wellington Road and the main entrance to the campus. Uh, so in the, the BLCB is the thermal hub. Um, basically, it's a series of modular electrically driven heat pumps that provide heating and cooling for the precinct um, with closed circuit condensers and heat reduction. So the image to the top right hand is the actual um, phase one of the heat pump. Um, a second image from what's underneath because we can't see the heat pump, so it's uh, quite a big commercial unit. Um, the system has primary, secondary, and tertiary hydraulics, and that has to do with the basic basic of the pumps and what level they go down to um, within each building. Um, the hub is going to serve seven buildings in the precinct uh, and has a total capacity of 4,000 megawatt cooling and 3,200 megawatt heating. Um, and the original business case for this precinct, we did have some storage uh, in the basement, but the civil engineering costs put in the tanks um, made us look at batteries. And so we put in a one megawatt vanadium flow system storage uh, energy storage system by Red Key. Um, and then as I said, within the precinct of so building 13A to F, there is various projects to upgrade the, the lighting, optimize the existing systems until they're connected, and putting on rooftop solar. Uh, some of the design considerations are in the blue stage one, um, which has been constructed on the roof of the LCB already. Um, and stage two is the yellow for future expansion. So we did um, have basically get the funding to put in the infrastructure for the expansion so when the other buildings then come on to the um, the hub. Uh, all the infrastructure is there, so the plant is there, the electrics are there, and essentially it's going to be the plug and play as we add additional buildings to the um, be powered by the hub. Uh, some of the other design, design considerations, considerations we're thinking about uh, making sure we have common bath control systems. At Monash, Monash we have about five, five different um, building management systems. I'm um, thinking about alternative fuels and energy storage, and then also the um, impact on the BLCB for internal space requirements. Uh, and I just wanted to quickly throw this in here as well because we do get asked a lot. Um, so at the moment, our Oil is fed by a central um, camping hot water, um, high temperature hot water loop, which is the one in red, it goes through an underground tunnel system. Uh, so as we transition to come off natural gas, we've been asked what are you going to do with that infrastructure. So one thing we have done is already put on a 500 kilowatt um, solar hot water um, to pre the water going into the main, the main boiler house that we've got up the top of the image. 
Um, and then we plan to expand that to one megawatt, um, which will basically um, meet some of our hot water demand. Uh, and then we take boilers basically off the system. The long-term plan for 2030 is converted to a low-temperature local precinct to provide domestic hot water for the campus. Uh, I just have this one in here that also to refer back to the guide and to what about all the technologies that you did go through, just to know that basically in doing our net zero strategy, you didn't use just one distributed energy technology. We use solar PV, batteries, solar and batteries, we use solar hot water, air source heat pumps, uh, PPA, uh, and then other as well. So we also have a microgrid project to control all of the technology. Uh, and I just thought I'd end up a bit of kudos for Monash. So we found out, it was announced last week that our next year initiative was one of the 15 projects internationally that won a United Nations um, 2018 Momentum to Change Award. So I just thought I'd like to um, had, had, had a on the back and say, um, we did, yeah, yeah, our has, has been, been recognized. So we are happy to um, share information. If you want to come and visit the campus and see what we're doing or learn about any of the initiatives and further details, then feel free to contact us. And that's all for me. Thank you, Kendra. And this is the showcase show is very, very much a whole of pre pre solution looking at a number of options, sort of the environment and the uh, so just to, um, just to close out in terms of this, um, a quick, quick, quick chat on financing, and you know, there is a dedicated section in the Indian report on financing, you get sort of a, a general guide to approach, but also CSD financing option. Uh, look, just very briefly, um, the property sector and the environment sector is a key area of focus of the, the CSD, uh, because it does Property sets in itself represent nearly a quarter of Australia's emissions, but look, you know, from what we've seen and, and case studies we've seen today, there's, there's really available technology now that can, can be used within the sector to, to reduce emissions, but also, more importantly, um, or equally importantly, uh, drive down uh, the cost of energy as well. Um, you know, from uh, today, we've committed uh, just over so one billion uh, of financing across uh, a range of sectors, and that ranges from equipment financing, so financing equipment, you know, energy efficiency, or clean energy equipment, or also a whole of building or portfolio financing where we finance portfolios of buildings on the basis that they set it then slower or higher clean energy efficiency standards. We've got a quick, quick uh, summary there of some of the recent investments we've done, but uh, the details are also on our, our website. I've sort of got some more specific case studies as well, but there are a couple of range of range of commercial and residential sectors. Uh, if we look at um, distributed energy and some of the CSC financing arrangements which are available now, that essentially help uh, owners uh, or developers um, in terms of uh, uh, implementing some of the technology and and standards, uh, we've got equipment and asset financing. Um, you know, CFC can provide uh, financing for uh, individual equipment, um, yeah, energy efficiency, clean energy upgrades, and we're ranging from as little as 10,000 uh, up to 5 million. Um, we don't provide the financing directly, but we do it through a series of partners, um, financing partners, which include uh, at present the major. Uh, Australian Trading Bank, Bank, Bank um, Macquarie Bank, Bank, and so here to be a learning platform uh, called Rate Setter, Setter, and the report includes uh, links to the, uh, the website uh, for each of those particular parties in those arrangements. Uh, equipment um, environmental upgrade agreements or EUA financing uh, is also another option uh, that the mechanism operating in. Uh, in South Wales, Victoria, and South Australia, with various councils where it facilitates um, you know, upgrades of existing buildings and the ability to pass through and finance those costs through uh, council rates. And again, the reporting is a link to the arrangement and the research funds management and the National Australia Bank. And finally, we also can provide direct financing. Uh, generally, that for uh, and for EUA financing, just in terms of dollar amounts, that's generally for upgrades of two hundred and fifty thousand uh, or above. 
And direct financing now we do run direct financing genuinely for project portfolios or large equipment upgrade rollouts, genuinely looking at the twenty million dollar in terms of that that financing. So we're um, we're right on time in terms of uh, Q and A. Um, so what I, I thought I'd do, I've got a Thank you, Thank you everyone, everyone for, for the questions that have been coming through. through. Um, we'll, we'll just go, go through them. I'll, I'll, I'll sort of literally direct them to, to uh, some of the presenters, but it's very much open to uh, all the presenters to, to comment on it. So look, one, one of the, the first, first questions that come, come up is um, you know, how fickle is the data, particularly payback period in savings to community housing, housing portfolio. So I don't know, uh, Matt, you, you want to touch on that first? Yeah, okay, that, thanks, Chris. One, One of the sub sectors that we looked at in the guide was the housing market, um, housing sub sector, sorry. sorry. So I think, I think public housing, housing I, I would assume, would be similar to, to um, the wider, wider housing sub sector in terms, terms of the energy cost. cost. So I think, I think the, the results result that we present to that sub sector would be very applicable to public housing. housing. Yeah, and that, I'd probably add yeah, that, 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 that I think in community housing you're going to get an extra building type as well in terms of standalone housing, housing to apartments as well, well that'd be fair. Yeah, yeah, I think that's fair. Comment. Um, the house, the housing the subsector that, that we looked at would be the, the, a standalone house, house and we also looked at residential, residential apartments. apartments. So they're, they're, each of those would have, have um, different opportunities applicable to that event. Um, Next question, we sort of did it a bit related to housing, housing again, and then this might, I think this opens up a, a few things around um, the energy and clean energy across the portfolio. Um, the question here, you know, we're considering linking uh, geographically diverse residential portfolio under one account over approximately 600 sites. These sites think that I'm going to need to need housing. housing. Some sites will have a larger array of PV panels required for the site energy usage. Is this a viable proposition? I suppose this is touching on not only on the site renewable energy behind the meter, but uh, potentially putting it into the grid. And then, so, so, Matt, you want to touch on that? And maybe there's an element of uh, PPA solutions as well that Kendra might want to comment on. And yeah, 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 well, well, yeah, yeah, great. great. Um, um, so the, the question about con considering the linking the, the portfolio is, is probably a, a, a good viable proposition um, to understand that combining the electricity billing, I assume that, 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 that we're hitting on. Um, having different size TV arrays on different properties is, is, is absolutely a sensible approach, selecting the system sizing that's suitable for each asset type and location. In terms, in terms of exporting on the group, group Chris, Chris um, depends depend on what, what state you're in, in um, what, what network, network you're operating in. in. Um, some are limited by export amounts, and, and some won't, won't provide financial incentives to do so. so. Typically, at the moment, moment, we would suggest that, that limiting export into the grid is the financially best approach, um, um, just because the payback is reduced if the export higher volumes. But I, but I think, think maybe, maybe moving, moving forward, forward people, people are now, now looking, looking at net metering, metering across, across their area portfolios and peer-to-peer -peer 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 trading is having, having more, of a, more, more of a topic, topic of conversation among, among the networks, networks and among some, some of the larger portfolio, portfolio operators. operators. So I think, I think in, in the coming, coming years, years we develop smart grid um, and, and two-way two trading that may very well become a viable proposition. But I think for the time being, sizing the systems for each side, it would probably be your best approach. Okay, I've got, a, I've got another, another question which is sort of linked to which might, might um, I think Michael, you might, uh, might want to use a comment on as well, well given your uh, battery control on the moment. The question is, you know, you heard from Michael that the round using battery to trade within the electricity market, short term market, but to get cash. Matt, what is your view on the extra use of battery and what potential do you see in the financial battery storage? Maybe 
that the, 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 the comment on that, that Mark, I'd be keen to maybe to extend that, that your, your experience of working with transgrid, maybe maybe tradition companies as well, because it's uh, the sort of and battery solutions that would be useful to, to touch on. Oh, yeah, sure. So, um, I guess within our portfolio, we have a large existing um, uh, you know, DC generation um, system for you know, our car parts, especially our larger, you know, our adult uh, parts, our large distribution centers. Um, and, and part of that was also some of our more advanced, we've got a lot of robotics and, and the like. Um, yeah, you know, the big amount of use of um, uh, UCS staff is to ensure that those electronics are, aren't damaging any way to a control shut down when we do lose power or we don't have the, the reliability and supply. Um, so just exploring where those opportunities with network retailers um, and also uh, ensuring that you've got some sort of capability within your own uh, retail contract to be able to, to uh, investigate and, and apply those. Um, I would say too that you know, the, the, in Victoria, for example, last summer, um, they you know, uh, investigated and worked, and that was quite a, a, a costly exercise. In order of some um, kind of the 50 or 60 or more dollars they spent between those um, reserves to ensure that the light stayed on. Um, and for large energy users, um, those sorts of builders that just make up and you, know, you, can, you can even build a business case on being able to either participate in, in those sorts of schemes or at least uh, work through that to be able to minimise those costs. Um, there are plenty of opportunities that there. It's just about trying to um, make sure that we've got something that also sets in operation. So, you know, again, there are um, in that, that summer period, that Christmas is our Christmas is our Christmas, so that is, and uh, you know, our operations guys are very, very uh, nervous about um, switching over to running on them. Um, battery or, or, or diesel generators is, uh, you know, going to be a good one to find, but at the same time, there's opportunity to support the with that, that's a bit of a balance that we have to run into, and so there's a bunch of interim stakeholder management, as well as about yeah, yeah, yeah. ensuring we've got the uh, control on the engine kind of service operating in that market. Um, um, and if I could probably add, yeah, so, you know, just touch up the previous question around the distributed um, residential portfolio, yeah, and then some of the ones we have during our yeah, yeah, cycle across, yeah, across Australia. Yeah. Um, very similar uh, issues, yeah, yeah. I, I, I would imagine. Um, and um, and yeah, we, we certainly take a portfolio view on, on some aspects, but um, um, the really comments about yeah, yeah, different yeah, networks, yeah, different yeah, rules and regulations, yeah, um, yeah, yeah, that, 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 that has been our experience with our role in our role. And yeah, yeah, it's easy yeah, to be able yeah, to deploy yeah, that, that, yeah, that, 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 that. It's probably one of the key issues that we come up with in terms of some of the network that can be fixed as well like night before we have the one more approach to be actually physically turn on on that one because of all the link right? This is other areas where we're able to sort of do it in a pretty quickly within a sort of three three period. So a lot of things about it in terms of sort of solar and which areas we talk about it. Matt, to you, and then also start to Kendra as well. I think, and we're getting, getting a few questions about uh, this whole new one with the economic on the back entry. Yeah, yeah. We, we, so um, within, within our objectives, objectives we, we've, we've, we've done, done a lot of modelling around um, battery financial models, and I think there's about, about seven different value streams, streams that you can create through, through having batteries. batteries. This is a very, very the results presented in the guide are very high level, level indicative numbers. numbers. So without uh, understanding site specific um, considerations uh, and, and, and your sort of approach, approach towards, towards FCAS markets, markets and things, things like that, that there are more opportunities for batteries. Still, still looking, still looking around, around that sort of seven, seven eight, eight year payback, payback even if we're optimizing the financial, financial return. return. It does, it does give you the opportunity, opportunity to increase the, the system, the solar system, system size, so, so therefore you might be able to pull that, pull that payback down, down a little, little further. further. Uh, and, and I think, I think it, does it does give you good opportunities to in, in demand side reduction, reduction as well. well. So if you're, if you're looking to access, access the, the SDR market, market um, that, that, that might be a good opportunity to do. Matt, have you seen any particular energy market that 
uh, around Australia, you can point out now that it, it, it's, 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 it's sort of the combination of the supporting battery dream and that. Well, you can see with the, the Tesla big black, black, black battery in the NSA, um, that, 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 that's been very successfully rolled out. out. Um, um, in terms of the financials on that, that, I don't, I don't think, think it's fantastic, but I but think, I think in, in terms of grid support, it, it, it's, it's doing its job excellently. I think, I think when the, the price, price of batteries comes, comes down, down over the next couple of years, years they, they, they will absolutely stack up. up. Other, people, other people like, like the city of Sydney have installed solar PV, PV and batteries on a couple of their um, distribution centres. And, it, and it, you know, when, when, when you're looking at grid upgrade costs, costs, costs or um, FCAP and auxiliary markets, markets then I think, I think there's definitely, definitely um, merit, merit in, in, in exploring, exploring that further. further. Thank you. Uh, uh, questions, questions for uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Kendra. Um, um, how is the investment in data to help you monitor and optimize energy usage? Uh, yeah, good question. So in a few ways, and uh, in a few ways we need to improve it as well. Um, so one of the big ones for the Net Zero project is there is the microgrid um, project that is being developed. So we have three HD remains on campus, um, and we're basically doing a pilot to concept, well, done type of concept within the um, first phase of the role of one of our remains. Um, but that's, um, that's very, very much, much focused, focused on um, how and when we use energy, energy um, responding to heat demand, um, um, also, also trying, trying to, to do a lot of research, research happening, so for the um, future energy, we call the future energy grid, or future energy hub, and um, 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 research around um, impact that because it's basically max with a lot of solar, solar what happens with having so much solar on our facility, and then also starting to get into looking at how we can develop new um, um, energy models, models for trading energy between buildings. So a lot of things we're doing as a, we're kind of like a little mini studio at the moment. And then we're using tests in the, 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 the um, confines of our own thing around what can we take it to the real world. Um, more around monitoring and optimizing energy use. So we have started a program early this year on building optimization, which is between Let's see, uh, about 30, 30 buildings over three years, years um, going, going through and looking for opportunities to optimize, to optimize um, and that's been done through consultants. And, uh, and, and then monitoring and energy, and uh, optimizing, optimizing energy use, we use the BMS system, system quite, quite a bit, but we are going through a strategy to look at what is our meter strategy, metering strategy going forward. And we've done a lot of investigation of very different analytic software and tools, and we're just trying to strategically decide which way we're, we're going, 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 kind of a collaboration between our um, building services, services, staff, staff the planning, planning team, which are tied in, and, um, and the, 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 the project, project team for delivery. Um, so I think it's to develop a better metering strategy. At the moment, we rely quite heavily on our building automation system, and then maybe not necessarily the best way to monitor and optimize energy. Um, just got a, a question, question probably, probably a few years in, probably a bit more um, specific in terms of, I think you mentioned your NPV analysis. Um, do you have some sort of additional background in terms of payback or do you use payback? Yeah, so the thermal precinct strategy as a whole, we haven't really focused on simple payback, because um, if you look at the simple payback, it's pretty long. Um, because it is part of our app renewal strategy, um, um, so we're looking, we're looking that's why we're looking at what the cost premium, premium above and how long that takes to pay back. back. Um, um, we do look at payback, I suppose, on individual technologies, like on LED, um, LED and solar. Um, we looked at simple payback, and that we, we got some finance through the CEFC on that, so we had to achieve certain um, hurdle rates. Um, um, and we didn't... didn't I'm not sure on the battery because before, before my time the decision made or whether they looked at the simple payback, payback on the battery. battery. Um, but um, but you also have so another thing that we take into consideration is the research um, um, element, element of it because we are a university. So, so again, again focusing just on simple payback, payback is probably not something that you do as, as much. But I'm happy uh, uh, to ask the question. question. Um, um, Mark, Mark, if you, you want to follow, follow up with me after, I'm happy to share, share. Um, um, more details with the specific things you want to know. Thank you. And 
Constantine, um, um, we've come to a good end in the area. There's, there's a, a whole lot of, lot of um, more questions, I think. think uh, yeah. Some of those are specific to, to individuals, and I think there are current on details in the, the um, the slide I have and carry charge I think all the people in the more have to have to do with queries directly. Um, um, thank you, uh, for everyone for, for joining. We, 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 uh, very much hope that it was, was useful, um, in terms of, um, going through, um, you know, the various technologies and particularly how this is practically applied, uh, at the world and Monash and I think the, the work group includes a series of other case studies as well, well and an example. In terms, in terms of, as, as we discussed, discuss the, um, the presentation will be uh, sent through later this week, 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 as well as a uh, recording, recording of the webinar. webinar. So if you missed anything in terms of what we've we'll discussed, you'll be able to catch up in relation to that. Uh, thank you thank also to Matt, uh, Michael and Kendra in terms of your presentation and answering Q&A. I think I think it's touched at the start. At the end of the webinar, people will be direct direct to do a survey. And again, thank you for joining.